Um, so uh, let me welcome everybody. I want to welcome the speakers. I want to welcome um, the attendees, the audience. Um, and I guess I should say, may the fourth be with you, um, since this is an IP related event. Um, so um, I, I, I'm Christine Haight Farley, and I'm a professor at American College of Law. And I am uh, also one of the faculty co-directors of our program on information justice and intellectual property. And we have um, a series, uh, which is to uh, debrief uh, the cases that the Supreme Court hears having anything to do with IP on the afternoon um, of, the, of the argument. So it's a, it's a same day debrief. And uh, we usually meet live. This is um, our, first, uh, our first opportunity to do this remotely. Um, our next installment, I guess, will be in the fall with uh, Google the Oracle. And I hope we can meet live. But if not, uh, we'll probably um, see, see you all here again then. Um, we love this series. Um, this, is, this is a lot of fun. Um, and I'm particularly looking forward to uh, hearing from you guys about your views on the case. Uh, I thought it was a really excellent oral argument this morning, um, really fun, and we have a lot that we could say. So I'm going to very, very briefly introduce the speakers, and I want to recommend if you want to know more about the speakers that you go to our event webpage where their bi biographies are linked. Um, so we have with us um, Professor Rebecca Tushnet, who's a professor at Harvard Law School. You may also know her from her 43B blog. Do you have, is that how you say that, Rebecca? I just say 43 blog. <laughs> um, and um, she was already famous, but she's more famous uh, now as a result of the oral argument uh, today because her name was uh, mentioned several times. Um, she has authored a uh, amicus brief on behalf of trademark scholars um, in support of neither party. Uh, we also have with us Professor Jake Linford, who is a professor at Florida State University College of Law. And um, he joined, he was um, worked on, was a co-author, mm. an important- a Laboring or I pulled the laboring. A, a laboring or uh, for another uh, brief on behalf of professors, trademark and internet professors. Uh, this brief was in support of respondents. Uh, next, we have Marty Schwimmer, who is a partner at um, Leeson and Ellis, uh, and he's famous from his trademark blog, um, which is a blog on trademark law, and so no, no trademark for you, Marty, for that one. Um, and he um, was a laboring or um, one of the authors of Inta's brief, also in support of respondents. And um, finally, we have uh, Cara uh, Gagliano. Is that how you pronounce your name? Cara Gagliano? Um, I'm she's froze up. Oh, okay. There she is. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, it's uh, Cara Gagliano. Cara Gagliano. Okay, thanks. Um, who is an attorney with the Electronic Frontier Foundation and filed a brief on behalf of EFF, and that brief was in support of petitioner. So we well-rounded, uh, uh, yes, petitioners. So we have a well-rounded um, group of speakers, <clears throat> all sides represented. Um, and I'm, as I said, I'm really excited to hear your views on the case. Um, I guess we should just spend a minute to note first that this is you know, um, a first time in history that the Supreme Court's oral argument was carried live um, by audio so people could tune in all over the world and hear it as it happened. Um, and uh, I say yes, please, to more of that. I thought that, that was great. But any, any um, reactions or comments you'd like to make on just this, this moment in history for the Supreme Court? Well, I would also, I would also say um, it was great to see uh, two uh, excellent uh, 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 female advocates um, doing a great job at this historic moment. Uh, still not something that you see every day. Uh, hopefully it will become unremarkable uh, in the years to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, anyone else? Don't wanna put you on the spot, but if you wanna say something about that, we can, we can mention it later if you like. Okay, 
So um, let me, before I ask um, you to start weighing in, let me just give a little bit of background on the case. Um, this is a trademark case that is not, that's oh, my phone. Uh, this is a trademark case that's not about a trademark dispute. Um, this is a case involving um, the trademark office's handling of four uh, separate trademark applications, each involving um, book, the word booking or the, the uh, letters booking.com. Um, each were rejected by the um, examining attorneys. I think there were four different examining attorneys uh, for each of these applications. And um, the refusal to register was based on the fact that the trademark office found them to be generic. Um, and this was appealed to the uh, Trademark Trial and Appeal Board, the TTAB, um, who affirmed the refusal. At that point, the applicant um, used the prerogative of going to um, uh, civil litigation in the Eastern District of Virginia, um, bringing a suit against the director of the PTO. Um, this is one of the two options given to applicants who are unhappy with the result of a TTAB decision. Um, they could have appealed to the um, Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, but they went instead to the Eastern District of Virginia. That district court reversed um, the ruling on, on, generis, uh, on the marks being generic, and the district court was affirmed by the Fourth Circuit. So that's the posture of the case um, <clears throat> uh, to this point. Now, I um, wanted to give um, the audience a little bit of background on the company and on the marks involved. Um, so BV is a Dutch company, but it's owned by an American holding company called Booking Holdings. Booking Holdings also owns Priceline.com, Agoda.com, Kayak.com, CheapFlight, Rentalcars.com, Momondo, and OpenTable. Um, this company has had some antitrust issues in the EU, the UK, and in Turkey. Um, as the lawyer for the respondent noted during oral argument today, uh, it has 85 worldwide, uh, 85 registrations for booking.com worldwide. Some of them, um, quite, a, quite a large number of those registrations are for design marks that include the words booking.com. Um, many of those registrations, which you can find on the, uh, in the WIPO database, um, describe the services in those uh, registrations as booking services. Um, there were many other uh, applications made by this company in the United States involving the uh, booking.com designation, and most of those applications were based on these foreign registrations. Um, these applications postdated two other relevant uh, applications. One was for ebooking.com, and the other was for bookings.com. Um, in the case of bookings.com, this company purchased that, um, that trademark, um, and it now redirects to booking.com. Uh, in the case of ebookings.com, um, that company disclaimed ebooking.com. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned that the company also owns rentalcars.com. It also owns villas.com. And in both of those um, uh, trademarks, the entire URL is disclaimed. In the case of villas.com, it also redirects to booking.com, I think maybe presenting a use and commerce problem for that trademark. Um, another interesting factoid from this research I did on their applications is um, bookings in one of these applications said that it had been using booking, the word booking as a trademark from 1996 until 2006, and it argued that um, it should deserve the priority based on that, the, the commercial use of that word, um, based on the doctrine of tacking. And it said in, that in making that argument that booking and booking.com are the legal, uh, booking.com is the legal equivalent of booking. So <clears throat> uh, I thought that was interesting background, especially in light of some of the discussion that happened in the case today. I would like to go down um, the line of speakers and ask you each um, to address two questions very briefly so we can get back to talking about other things. Um, I, you know, you, there are a lot of cases 
of interest and you have a uh, limited amount of time and energy. So the first question I want each of you to address is, why did you find this case of interest or importance um, that you decided it was worthy for your efforts in an amicus brief? And then I'd like you to very briefly, maybe just tell us about what the main takeaway um, is from the brief that, that you submitted. And um, let, me, let me start with you, Kara. Gotta unmute. I like even the justices struggled with that today. It made me feel a little better. Um, so for why we were interested, I mean, first, there's the fact that the Supreme Court only takes trademark cases so often. Um, and I'd say it's perhaps even rarer than that for EFF to find itself siding with the PTO. Um, so that already made it an interesting case for us. But you know, a, a confluence of a couple other things made me really jump on this. One was that I think uh, being at EFF, we had a particularly <laughs> acute awareness of how wrong uh, this type of, basically how, how wrong the Fourth Circuit's decision could go and, uh, you know, allowing registration and protection, protection for <laughs> a mark like booking.com, um, especially for individuals with limited resources. So for those who don't know, just very briefly, EFF is a nonprofit advocacy organization. And part of our work is pro bono representation of people with issues kind of at the intersection of tech and civil liberties, including IP issues. So we bring the perspective not only of practitioners, but practitioners who people turn to when they can't afford legal fees, um, and especially with this case, much less expert fees, um, which I know is a whole other issue here. Um, and, and in fact, you know, actually shortly after um, of filing our amicus, I had a case come up that reminded me very much of this. Um, some folks watching might be familiar with the Ninth Circuit decision in Free Cycle Sunnyvale versus the Free Cycle Network, uh, where the court affirmed a decision that the Free Cycle Network had lost any U.S. trademark rights to the term Free Cycle through naked licensing. So I knew about that. What I didn't know, and what you might not know, is that what did Free Cycle Network do? They went and got a registration for freecycle.org. That came to my attention when I, I got an email from someone looking for help because her Facebook group, Free Cycle Fairlawn, didn't say freecycle.org anywhere on it, just Free Cycle Fairlawn, got uh, you know, a threat from the Free Cycle Network saying, you're infringing our mark in freecycle.org. Uh, so that's exactly the kind of situation we're concerned about companies being able to use this type of mark to leverage an unprotectable term and just by putting it in a domain name, uh, you know, being able to benefit from that. And then the other reason I was really interested is I've, at EFF, been working on uh, work involving the domain name system and domain policy. Uh, and because of that, I am very sensitive to the fact that not all Top-level domains, as they talked about .com as an example of a top-level domain, they're not all created equal. Um, and so that's potentially, that's especially concerning for us in terms of potential restrictions on the choice of, of your domain name. Great. Um, okay, let, why don't I uh, turn next to Rebecca? Uh, thanks. The reason uh, that I was interested also, because you don't get too many trademark cases at the Supreme Court, but also because uh, the, the case raises a very important and under thought issue um, in American trademark law, which is what is the relationship between trademark registration and the registrability of a mark and the baseline unfair competition protection. So US courts have steadily narrowed the difference between unfair competition and trademark, uh, the rights granted by a registration. Um, this may have been a mistake. Recently, there have been other 
in some cases saying, hey, wait a second, there actually is a space when you don't have a registrable trademark, maybe you have space for unfair competition protection, but with more limited remedies than would be available. Um, and so this is, uh, booking is a really uh, good case to talk about that because um, one of the issues is if they can't get a registration, what can they do if someone, you know, spoofs the domain name uh, in emails that look like they say booking.com, but they actually send you to another uh, place that's trying to scam you. Uh, and unfair competition principles would allow uh, a court to take action against that, even if booking.com is not registrable. So that was a, a, a part of our brief. Um, then uh, just to, to give you the capsule summary very quickly. Um, the, the other issues that uh, concern us were the question of uh, basically baseline rules. So it is pretty true that very few people would talk about uh, booking websites as booking.com. So that's not inconceivable. Uh, but the reason to have uh, a rule that co combining a generic term uh, with .com or .net can't uh, actually ungenericize it is actually about the freedom of producers, of, of people on the selling side to do things. And I think uh, Cara's uh, explanation of how these rights can be over asserted very easily once acquired um, is, is very helpful. Uh, the related issue here is uh, protectability versus the scope of rights. So booking.com in its argument before the Supreme Court is asking for a really teeny tiny little right. At, at least that's what it says. And the question uh, that is in part a significant policy question is, is the game worth the candle? Given how teeny their rights are, does it make sense to say you can have a registration for this uh, when they claim not to want to sue anybody uh, uh, who does even something t slightly different like ibooking.com or booking.london? Um, and of course, uh, although I believe that the lawyers uh, at booking.com are acting in perfect good faith, um, they don't speak for everyone and they don't actually control what booking does in the future when it gets new lawyers. So I think that's a serious concern. Uh, relatedly, um, the, there are questions of uh, what's called de facto secondary meaning, a doctrine that's been around for a long time, which is to say that just because there's a practical association with a generic term and one primary producer in the market. Um, we haven't in the past allowed that to mature into trademark rights because of the interest in competition uh, and preserving the term for other people to use. Uh, which leads to the final thing that we were uh, interested in in the brief, which is uh, booking.com survey. Um, purports to show uh, that there's a, re a substantial recognition of it, um, probably due to successful advertising. They're, they're a successful company, that makes sense. Um, but the survey show uh, that they used to show this had some pretty substantial weakness, is including that, um, you know, 40 percent of the same people who were asked whether booking.com was a trademark thought that uh, washingmachine.com was a valid trademark or they weren't sure. The very same people, 100% of them knew that supermarket was, they were confident that supermarket was actually a generic term. Um, and, you know, there's something wrong with surveys asking people a legal question that they're just not going to be in a good place to answer when we, we all understand that as a practical matter, booking.com is a unique source because they have a domain name registration. And that just interferes with the ordinary questions that we ask about consumer perception of trademark meaning. And uh, so we wanted to talk about that. Great, okay. Uh, Jake, let's move to you. Great. Uh, so like everybody else, you, know, you don't get a case like this every day. And about five years ago, five, six years ago, I started poking around uh, the, the protectability spectrum, the Abercrombie test we use, you know, genericness, descriptiveness, et cetera, and found all sorts of problems with it from the perspective of what do we think consumers actually do with the language bits that we call trademarks. And the part of the project that looked at genericness, uh, I was troubled a bit by the fact that we have, you know, what Rebecca refers to as this uh, defective secondary meaning doctrine or this trademark incapacity doctrine where we treat certain terms as though they cannot change, as though they can't be widened. 
or sorry, narrow. Trademarks can be widened, right? Cellophane can go from a protectable term to a generic. Aspirin can go from a protectable term to a generic. And you see this with language generally. A dog used to be large domesticated canines, and then in English broadened to a sense for any dog. Happens all the time. The, what the de facto secondary meaning doctrine, if you enforce it strictly, misses is narrowing may be a more common phenomenon and is one that matters to consumers in the trademark context as well as generally. So queen used to be any wife or woman, became a female regent. Hound used to be any dog narrowed to a large hunting dog. Deer used to be any animal narrowed to today's deer. The idea here is narrowing happens all the time. You can see it actually in the case law. So kisses used to be a generic confection and then we have some trademark cases from the, uh, from the uh, late 20th century, early 21st century where kisses acquires protection. Hershey Company acquires protection in the term kiss uh, for confections. The Goodyear term itself, which is the, the Goodyear's case that if you're listening to the oral argument, the USPTO kind of focused its argument on, petitioner focused its argument on, that term has really narrowed again to be a trademark term. And then the question is, should we be looking at evidence of narrowing in a case like booking.com? The USPTO's argument is, no, we should have a bright line rule against a term that we've decided. And I guess the, U the PTO decides in the moment the registration is filed, that booking is a generic term, dot com adds nothing. And then based on these dictionary definitions or based on the examiner's sense of the meaning of the term at, at the point of registration or at some point in the past, that that term is going to be denied, uh, not only that we're going to deny it protection, but that we're not going to look at whether consumers actually use it as a source signifier. And I thought five years ago that sort of mistake uh, was a problem for a couple of reasons. I think it would be a problem in this case. Uh, uh, and, and, and the reasons are, first of all, uh, a big chunk of the error cost analysis, the, is the game worth the candle question, I think presumes that this happens so infrequently that we ought not extend protection to generic terms that acquire distinctiveness in the eyes of consumers. I think that's probably mistaken. Part of it is based on relying too heavily on old definitions. Linguists would call this an etymological fallacy uh, where you take a meaning as it was at time one and presume that meaning doesn't change. Of course, the trademark system is a system about meaning changing over time. If terms are becoming generic, it's because they were source signifying at time one. They slide into genericness at time two. Uh, the reverse change isn't impossible to imagine. And in fact, if you look through the case law happens uh, more frequently than courts want to recognize it or give it credit. There's also a competitive harm point where I think a bright line rule would end up ignoring source significance in the eyes of a majority of consumers. Uh, leaving aside, I think Rebecca's very good question about how do we handle the washingmachine.com problem in the book.com case, right? Is the survey problematic? Does it show us that in every case uh, consumers are going to look at dot com marks as source signifying and that every consumer is going to be confused by that? If you look at the survey, um, you do see uh, some evidence, but not every consume, not every survey participant persuaded that dot com, uh, that washing machine dot com is protectable. But if you do have good evidence, uh, and leave aside booking.com for a moment, I'm more worried about the general principle. If you have evidence that a majority of consumers see the thing as a source signifier, see that mark as pointing to a source, uh, there is a competitive harm for those consumers when the mark holder doesn't have tools to vindicate its rights. My last point is, uh, I think the unfair competition remedies, they might be appropriate in the booking.com case. I think they're frequently too narrow. And I talk about this a little bit in my brief. So for those reasons, you know, I, I drafted the brief and, you know, went hunting for some, for some like-minded scholars who were persuaded by the argument. Great. Good. Okay, Marty. So first I want to say that the reasons why I was attracted to the case may not completely coincide with INTA's interests, or at least the points that they needed to make in the brief. As background, INTA might have 10,000 members so it's sort of hard to have a position that is going to fairly indicate everything that all of those members are going to say. I'm just attracted to it. It was, the, as far as I know, the first Supreme Court case involving registrability of domain names in any way during my career. I think it was the first Supreme Court case involving registrability of a word mark 
in my career. And I had some really workman day-to-day -day concerns about the procedure. Practitioners have sort of a gut feeling as to how to argue a case on registrability and what order these things are. And when I had to do pellet briefs on this issue, there is no case law that definitively says, first, pick up your dictionary and the burden is on this party or that party. So I was looking for that sort of clarity, which I don't think I'll get. Um, with regards to INTA, um, I think it came down to the sort of thing that they felt that everyone could agree to. No per se rules. We just did not want Goodyear to apply as a per se rule and knocking out um, all generic .coms. The next point, and that uh, related point, and I have to just do hats off to Rebecca. As I go over the, the transcript from this morning and the wrap up, mm -hmm. someone who was not in the room got everyone talking about washingmachines.com and not tennis.net. Because I think that if respondent had been able to completely control the dialogue, it would, we would only be talking about tennis.net. But instead we talked about washingmachines.com and that's gonna be really important. Um, the only other point was a very technical point in the INT brief about surveys. Um, and I'm trying not to think about the crab house joke at this point. Um, in other words, a very minor point, don't, don't discount surveys. This actually speaks to my point of, and, and this is the, the crab house case, um, what order does the examining attorney or, or a court look at this evidence? The concern there being that you can't just say everyone knows that Crab House is generic. You can't, do not assume what you've been asked to decide. Um, and I think that sort of technical, this is the order in which you make your determination as to whether it's generic or descriptive. That's the point that the INTA brief tried to make. Um, while I ask you my next question, if I could ask Russell to put up the first uh, poll, I'm going to poll the attendees. I don't think our speakers can participate, um, but I'd like the um, attendees to go ahead and answer that poll. And Clarifying question. Do yes. we mean generic ex ante or do we mean generic today? How consumers use it. <laughs> Um, since I didn't say, I'm not going to say right now. That's <laughs> spoiling the test there, Jake. All right, fair enough. All right. Um, we only have 21% participating. Now, now you've made them think about this. Three writers. Okay, 75, 72%. Um, I'm just going to give it a second. All right. Um, so my question, while the, while the audience is answering that question, I'm going to phrase the question a little bit differently for you guys. Um, is booking.com a genus or a species? Who wants to jump in and answer that? I mean, I'm happy to talk about it, though I'm probably not going to answer it directly. Um, which is the, so this is the consumer versus producer oriented distinction, right? So um, uh, it, it, I think very, everyone agrees that no one would say like, I went to a booking.com or I mean, actually I can imagine certain older people of my acquaintance, um, but uh, you know, it's not the first thing that you would say. Um, and so the, the, the real question is, are there constraints other than what we think consumers think on what we should leave open? Uh, and so sometimes when the question is, is chocolate fudge soda, right, a, uh, a generic, then the genus species question is helpful. Do uh, You might wanna know, is chocolate fudge a specific kind of soda or is it just a descriptive variant of chocolate soda? Their genus species may help you draw the distinctive generic line, although even there, I'm not super convinced that it's doing a ton of work. Uh, really, what, you're, what it's doing is uh, inviting you to exercise your priors about 
uh, whether fudginess is a distinctive characteristic that you know makes a subgroup uh, of things. And you know, one of the reasons that we ended up in this place, I think, is because uh, we actually have a terrible a uh, terrible time figuring out what the, the proper definition of a market is in any field, right? So antitrust does a terrible job and unsurprisingly trademark also does a terrible job. So genus species is, uh, you know, one shorthand, but I'm not sure it's helpful all the time when our question really should be, um, you know, what's the balance of consumer protection and producer certainty that we need to create a competitive environment? Okay, all right. Um, let, let me, uh, so I don't know if everybody can see the, the, the poll results. I think there was 78% participating, 64% um, percent, um, say that it is generic and 36% say that it's not, um, the, uh, looks like washingmachine.com actually. <laughs> Quite a bit. So, uh, so if you don't like that question, um, could you answer the question, um, what is a booking.com? Do you like that question better? What is a booking.com? What is a booking.com? Booking.com is a website people use to purchase travel. And I think arguably a source signifying mark for the business that is run from that website. I think, I think to go back to your genus species question a little bit, I think the, the argument worth having, I think is, is in a way exactly as Rebecca says it, um, where do we think there is a competitive loss for Booking.com's competitors if we allow them to acquire source signification or, or, or we give them legal protection for the source sign significance they do acquire? Um, and do we think the outcome of that is that they're going to be able to, whether we think they will or not, stop other marks with Booking.com in them as individual elements from competing? And the answer to that question is yes. And we think that outweighs uh, the harm to consumers if we see uh, Booking.com incapable of protecting its market. And I'm not persuaded the unfair competition move will get us there. Uh, then I think you decide, uh, you know, in favor of the USPTO or you decide against red. Jake, you're cutting it out. We can't hear you. As an element in trying to figure that out. Sorry. Yeah, you were you were cutting out. We I think we missed a bit just a bit of that. Um okay. Okay, well I was probably feeling you um Kara and and Marty, you can you can jump in on this question, but I'd I'd really like to get to the test. There was a lot of discussion in the oral arguments today about the tests, um, you know. And and Marty, you I think you were the one who raised this very particularly and said that uh, the INTA does not want a per se rule. Um, there was discussion about whether the um, USPTO was arguing for a per se rule or a categorical rule. Uh, was there another rule? Um, is there another test other than the primary significance test? Uh, what, you know, I think there was a, there was a, I thought that um, the government did a terrific job um, presenting its case today, but right at the end, uh, there was a question from Justice Kagan, which was essentially, you know, if we don't buy this, what she claimed was a categorical rule that a term which would be generic for the particular services plus uh, dot com is, is um, non-protectable, um, what else do you got, right? What other test is there? Um, is there something other than primary significance? Um, I, just on the point of per se rules, I thought it was interesting that the Eastern District of Virginia kind of flipped um, the per se rule and said just the opposite, right? So it, it also is a per se rule. It just goes in the opposite direction. Um, the Eastern District of Virginia said uh, a generic term in the second level of the domain plus a, a, a top level domain is per se um, um, uh, merely descriptive. Um, and then we just ask whether there's secondary meaning. Um, and I think that is, um, uh, what the Eastern District of Virginia thought was that um, people will, that, that dot com is different than Corp or Inc, right? 
um, that people know that because it's a second level followed by a top level, it is one site. So it is one source. Um, so it would have been very interesting to have a washing machines corp in that, in that survey to see if it, it reached a different result because it seems to me um, between the uh, Federal Circuit and the Eastern District of Virginia, there's a difference um, of perception about how consumers would react. So, so what do you all say about these rules? Um, what, what rule do you think will win the day in this case or what rule do you think should win the day? Marty, since you, you said no per se rule, where does so, that go? So you're, you're correct. I actually highlighted that part of the transcript and it was unfortunate that um, petitioner was cut off right in the middle of answering that question. But the next justice who I can't recall said, actually, can you please give me the answer to that? And this is what I think petitioner said. We can't have a, um, if I can't get a per se rule, if we cannot use Goodyear rubber as a per se rule, then at least give a very high standard of secondary meaning. Go back to the transcript and see she's, she's interrupted, um, so we can't really tell. And that's a shame because that was like in a way the key of the case. It's, it's not so much about per se rules, it's that we, we have a somewhat uncontested doctrine that if it's a descriptive term, it is not registrable, but for a showing of secondary meaning. And then we have something of a contrary doctrine. If we have a generic term, then there's no amount of secondary meaning that can save it. I suppose my position is you can live with both of these rules as long as you do a, a proper two-part evidentiary inquiry. Is this initially, is the trier fact believing that it's either descriptive or generic? If I find that it's generic, then you are officially out of luck. If I find that it's a descriptive, please show me sufficient secondary meaning. The PTO seems to be saying, if we lose and you can't apply Goodyear and you find that it is descriptive, which is what I think the 1-800 cases would suggest you should find, then please show us an awful lot of secondary meaning. That's what I understand the PTO's position. I'm a little bit disappointed that the 1-800 cases were not fleshed out today. Um, I am somewhat um, influenced by the following analysis. Dot com is, does not function like incorporated or limited or company. And this is where washingmachines.com actually may come in. That the fact that 33% felt that washingmachines.com might be a brand suggests to me that the public comprehends.com as signifying a domain name, duh. And that the domain name, what the domain name does is describe the way of getting in touch with a particular unitary source. I may not know them, but that's all I know. It's descriptive. It's functioning like a telephone number. If I hear 914-821-8011, what I know about the world tells me that this is somebody's trademark, some, sorry, somebody's telephone number, okay? What if I file for that as, as a trademark, okay? I should have to show a lot of secondary meaning in order to prove that I'm entitled to protectability. I'm somewhat convinced by the argument of the 800 cases that someone sees booking.com or whatever, and they say, well, this is a domain name. It's describing the way of getting in touch with some origin. I don't know who the origin is. Then is there secondary meaning? Yes or no? So um, Marty, then um, I looked, there doesn't seem to be an operating website for washingmachines.com. Um, so if I have a service 
let's make it a little bit more interesting than selling washing machines on the internet. Let's say I'm going to connect people with um, people who will come fix their washing machines. Um, I apply for washingmachines.com as a trademark without having the domain name. Y you're saying that um, we, get, we, we, we start from the position of that's a merely descriptive mark and I need to show secondary meaning? I think so. I think, and just try it, just try to plug in telephone numbers in that same fact pattern. But if it's, if you're saying it's descriptive because it describes where to find them and Christine is saying she, her hypothetical trademark registrant does not actually have that domain, is it misdescriptive actually? And another question would be, could that, could, could that trademark registrant then <laughs> block someone else from registering the domain washingmachines.com? Well, I think that fact pattern is the same as if I file for 1-800-MATTRESS and I don't have the underlying telephone number. So they should not, they sh and yes, there could be a misdescriptiveness. So I think I've agreed with everything you said. On the question of the test, I really do think the primary significance test is the right one. I think we can have an argument over whether booking.com's evidence shows primary significance or not. I think that's, you know, uh, Rebecca's nice move with uh, washingmachines.com. But I think if the majority of consumers, however we reflect that, see that mark as a source signifier, I think that's got to matter as much as an examiner's or a court's determination about what the term meant ex ante at time one. And I think the actual meaning in the eyes of consumers should be given some weight, not dispositive weight, but not that we should have a per se rule. I like the idea of the 50% threshold for terms that were considered generic. Uh, that's not the operating threshold for every descriptive term. Uh, so that's a little bit different than the rule Marty proposes. You know, you get courts all over the place, but most of them aren't requiring some sort of, you know, 50%, uh, you know, majority use threshold. So can I uh, give uh, the alternative, um, which is, uh, I, I actually think that a, a good rule that, that is competition protective and actually helps shape behavior, right? So uh, sophisticated actors um, like companies that, you know, want to control a category um, should be able to adapt their behavior to it. Um, the, the basic rule that uh, it, unless uh, the generic plus generic is more than the sum of its parts, it's still generic. Right. If, if, if every part of it, it means exactly what it means in the dictionary, then uh, we can have a, a, a predictable rule and one that, that in particular deals with the competitive concerns, which I think the court was somewhat sensitive to. Right? And um, uh, I just want to say here something about Jake's argument, which I think is uh, very important. Um, you know, I, I understand the appeal of it, but you know, what's going on here is not that the meaning of booking has narrowed in any way. Instead, uh, the claim is that booking.com is not the same thing as booking, which I think is a different thing. Um, and the related to that, you know, my argument that the game is not worth the candle is not an argument about whether narrowing happens a lot or a little. It's about how often booking.com's claims against other booking dot sites whether booking.london or ibooking.com or something else, how often those claims are gonna be bad claims versus how often it will actually have a valid claim. Um, and the answer to that, even booking.com's lawyer says is, we will almost never have a valid claim. So that's the part where I think the game is not worth the candle. Uh, I would jump in to say I, and uh, my colleagues at EFF completely agree with I think everything Rebecca just said um, in terms of both the trade-off and the appropriate test, I think another way of thinking of that test would be, you know, looking at the second level domain primarily. It's saying, is this a generic term for the goods or services? And if it is, then you ask, well, is the dot-com doing anything extra? Is it adding anything more than just being tacked on than just making it into a domain name. Um, because that's when you get into the issues I talked about before where it's, you can have anyone saying, 
oh, okay, I can't register a generic term, but as long as I slap on a .com, that's great. I wanted to register that for my business anyway. That is the domain name that you would want. Um, and especially, too, when you think about how Internet users really look at domain names, I mean, I think the, the really tricky thing with this case is it's hard to just kind of pull it out of the Internet context and say, well, we're talking about use as a trademark, so we want to analyze it as a trademark. But when you're just pulling it out like that and saying, okay, if we're looking at it being used as marks out in the world, then it, it's ignoring the effect it will have on registrations that aren't necessarily using it as a mark. And, you know, there can be debate over, well, maybe even they wouldn't be liable if they weren't using it as a mark. Um, but, you know, that it still brings a lot of legal risk for those people. And when you're in the context of using domain names as domain names, you know, users are focusing on the first part, the second level domain, um, which I think is is kind of revealed, uh, supported partly by what Christine, you mentioned you, you found that booking.com had actually said <laughs> booking.com is equivalent to booking, similar also to a, a fact we noted in our brief that, you know, booking.com, the company has also secured a contract from ICANN, the body that runs uh, the entire domain name system, to be basically have exclusive authority over the dot booking top level domain. So it controls booking.com and anything dot booking. It gets to control and, and exclude every one of its competitors from dot booking. Um, and in its application to get that contract, it said, it repeatedly said, you know, Booking is the key element of our mark, and we want this to be able to protect the key element of our mark. Because they get it. They know that that's, you know, no one is paying that much attention to the .com. You're focused on the second level domain, and what comes after is just kind of the tacked on functional bit, with .com in particular being essentially a default. Um, I want to come back to um, Rebecca, your suggestion that the question is whether you look at what becomes before the dot, what becomes what comes after the dot, and um, if the the sum of the the parts is not more than the two generic spaces, then you don't get it. How is that different from the Goodyear case, right? I mean, that's all that Goodyear said was that um, what, what were the examples they gave? Cotton Corp or Wine Corp. Um, there's no, there's, you know, the sum of its parts doesn't add up to anything other than two generic terms. Is, is there something different there? I don't think so, right. Uh, so uh, I, I, I thought of Goodyear as actually standing for that proposition. Okay, all right. And then the, the question that seems to, to lie here is whether, you know, um, so there's a lot of discussion of Goodyear, almost no discussion of Kellogg's, um, uh, Nabisco versus Kellogg. Um, and there was some discussion, Marty, of 1-800-MATTRESS, um, but I guess th there seems to be some question about whether the, the top-level domain is a different beast. And, and I note that um, Alito, Justice Alito, asked very pointedly, you know, like, do we need, do we need an, in I think he said, an internet age rule? Um, and so there, there seems to be a lot of suggestion in the arguments and in the lower opinions that because of the singularity of the URL, it communicates something very specific to consumers, which is this is one source. And because it does that, it cannot be generic, right? And that gets back to my question about can there be a species here? There can be a species. There's only one. There's, there's, there can only be in our domain name system uh, one URL. And, and so let me um, leave you with that question and then um, let me let the attendees know that you've had, um, I, I see that there are some questions that have been entered and I invite you to, to enter some now and then we'll, we'll turn the speakers over onto your questions. So did you want an answer to that question? Well, you know, I mean, I was just waxing, but I had Jake. Well, one of the things that stuck, stuck out to me, I, I went looking for uh, the, 
the colloquy that Marty was describing was in response to Justice Gorsuch, right, where uh, uh, counsel petitioner gets to what I think was a siloing argument that sounded a little bit to me like what you were saying, Christine, there, which is if booking.com gets protection because it is a, uh, because each dot com is unique, the same thing should be true of ebooking and then everybody gets their own tiny distinct silo. And I, I don't have a problem with that rule, although I think it's actually a little stronger than the one I would advocate for, which is I think there are some marks, you know, dot com marks that don't get out of the genericness bucket. They don't get out of the genericness crab bucket. Um, and so instead, you know, they don't get protection. The ones that do, do. And I think there will be a, a sorting there. But that seemed to be the rule that the, the petitioner um, was willing to offer Justice Gorsuch. If you're, if you're hunting for it, it'll be on page 33. Yeah, I guess re responding with a, a different tack to your question, Christine, I'd take the, the first part and say that we absolutely agree that domain names are a different beast, but in kind of the opposite direction. Um, and I think that's a, I won't belabor the point I've, I've already raised that I, you know, I would say that the generic dot com marks are actually even worse than a generic company or generic ink mark because they're okay. It's bad enough that, you know, you have, you have the same issues with generic dot com as you do with generic company or generic ink having to avoid the use of the generic, but at the same time, it's like, okay, it's just, it's just a word. It doesn't have any special import to have the ink on there. You don't get a special advantage from having ink at the end of your mark or co or company. You can get a special advantage from having .com over, say, .biz uh, that, that people are going to see differently. Um, and as our brief highlighted, that can even have differences in the rights, the legal rights that you have as a registrant of the domain or in the actual security and stability of your website. Uh, these, these things that consumers mostly don't pay that much attention to, except when something seems off, um, you know, you might notice if, if a charity has a .com, you might be a little bit suspicious because you expect a .org. Um, so that's the way that it matters. Um, but even when they aren't noticing, the top level domain that you choose actually does make a difference. So if competitors are forced into a position where they're saying like, okay, how do we make our name different enough while still using the term for our goods and services, you know, they're limited in their choices. You can't, you can't stylize or anything like that. Uh, you can choose a different top level domain, even though .com might be kind of the gold standard and, the easiest one for people to remember, or you can mess with the second level domain um, and have to make sure that you're getting far away enough from this generic term for your goods or services. Uh, so that, that's why, to me, the, the generic.com context is actually a lot worse even than a generic company or generic ink type mark and requires really special consideration. I wanted to um, talk about a point that Rebecca raised in her very, her initial remarks, which was this, we're not really sure on the difference between protectability and registrability. Um, it's an issue that came up or could have come up in the Redskins case, where we could have answered the question, to what extent can someone who owns a mark, we will deem it not to be registrable and yet we will continue to protect it under, for example, Section 43. And there's a point that I think respondent's attorney, who, who did a magnificent job, but didn't bang this drum quite the way she could have, perhaps, when asked unfairly, I think, why do you want a registration? She would, she at one point said, I think, in REM protection, mm -hmm. national in REM, and at another point referred to cyber fraud. Um, and I think what, what might have been more effective if the facts had justified it is to what extent have people abused the booking.com name? 
um, there is a doctrine that there's, there's an argument that is not universally admired in trademark law is the fact that we were copied is itself evidence that our mark exists as a protectable mark. Okay. Um, McCarthy does a good, a good rebuttal of that argument, but it might not be in this situation, which is, you know, if someone did go through a fraud and, and sent out malicious emails that said they were from booking.com and there's other evidence about that fraud that suggests that they were referring to us, booking being, that kind of proves my point. I've got myself a trademark, right? Um, now, Kellogg and some other cases to a certain extent say, no, there's this concept of passing off and we're going to, we're going to give non-trademark protection under section 43, right? Um, but I'm not, I'm not quite sure that oral argument today at least vetted that point as to, again, I'm not sure the question should be posed to any registrant, why do you want, to any applicant, why do you want a registration? Um, but I think that this could be part of the answer. I've got myself a protectable mark and the way I know that is that people are are infringing it. Okay, um, I, I would love to stay longer and, and maybe we in fact can, um, but as we've promised the audience that this will end in an hour and they've asked questions, I wanna um, spend some time talking about the questions that, they, that they've asked. Um, one of the questions comes from a, a trademark examining attorney um, who wants to know from the panelists and I guess it's really um, directed at, uh, well, the question isn't directed, but I'm gonna direct it at, at Marty and Jake. Um, if we don't have something like a per se rule, um, but if we have a rule that involves primary significance, testable through secondary meaning, um, survey evidence, how do you see the trademark office dealing with issues of generic marks when they are applied for? How do you expect the, the, the examining attorneys to deal with, for instance, survey evidence? Well, I would have liked in this case to provide examiners a numbered list, okay? To a certain extent, we, we kind of know there are articulated sources they don't order them importance. You're allowed to give the weight that you want to. Here's the dictionary, here are industry databases, here's the media, do a Google search, right? There's enough to know that you could then make an initial determination that it's registrable or it isn't registrable, that it's descriptive or it's generic. Mm -hmm. And in theory, you met your, the board had, the PTO has the burden. They've either met it or they haven't, right? And then the applicant can rebut the evidence or it can't. No per se rules, just it's, you know, the evidence takes you where, you where you're supposed to go. I think the way I'm imagining it is pretty similar to that. And in part, it's, I think, difficult to know exactly what to do given my general distrust of, a, of, 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 a pers uh, of an ex ante genericness category, whether we should treat everything as the same or whether we should treat them as different, the things that the examiner thinks at the first jump is generic versus descriptive. Assuming we want to keep that line, then I think we do the same thing we've done historically and the, and the burden of evidence required, and this is going to be a little mushy, uh, is going to be something like, you know, the. 25 to 45 percent threshold depending on which cases you're looking at for descriptive terms to acquire distinctiveness and over 50 percent that's the kind of showing we should see from a survey and again it will be in the hands of the examining attorney to figure out whether or not and how much it's the booking.com case i don't Really, I think that I think that's something that they are probably fielding now. Now, I could be wrong. I could be wrong, and you could show me empirical evidence that says this will increase their labors by an order of magnitude, and I will repent of the position I currently hold, which is it's not going to cost that much. 
Any um, reactions by Kara or Rebecca to? Well, so obviously the key thing here is that the PTO doesn't do surveys, right? So uh, the, the survey evidence only comes in um, so it can occasionally come in if there's an opposition. So I'm thinking of the subway sheets case, uh, so, but in general, um, the, the, the pattern is going to be, um, the examiner says, here's all this dictionary evidence. Um, and the applicant says, well, here's my survey. And frankly, the federal circuit is gonna say, well, you should listen to the survey, because it's a survey. Uh, and I think that's actually a serious problem um, because the, I, I think the TTAB, um, actually has a pretty good handle on how it deals with surveys. It says some of them are good, some of them are bad. Uh, the federal circuit does not. Um, and I think that is a serious practical problem, which gets into my game worth the candle error costs uh, area. Um, so one thing that might be quite interesting for people who are who wanted to develop, you know, a, a, a serious test for finding, uh, you know, meaning that you are confident with secondary meaning. Uh, it would be a very interesting thing to run basically the same survey, uh, but instead of screening people after you'd told them, this is a trademark, this is a generic term or common name, um, which is the recognized survey procedure. Um, if you'd instead, so, so they trained people to see if they understood Kellogg and cereal. And if you correctly categorize those, you got through and then they showed you a bunch of others, including booking.com. I think it would be super interesting to see what would happen if you did the screening question on washingmachine.com and uh, not and amazon.com instead of Kellogg cereal, which is actually not the, the interesting thing or the, or the hard thing here. I, I, I wonder, and it might be the case, uh, uh, Jake might be uh, right or booking.com might be right, that even if you do that screening, they still show a bunch of secondary meaning. Uh, but I think that if, we're ha if we have to look at surveys, then the screening question should screen for whether people understand exactly what's at issue, um, rather than uh, letting them coast on their, uh, on, on what is in fact a very strong practical association between having a .com and having a single source. Seconded. <laughs> okay. Um, should we go on to another question? So the Chief Justice started the argument, this is uh, from a question, my interpolation of the question. Uh, Chief Justice started um, the line of questioning by asking um, the government uh, why they were talking about Goodyear when we have a Lanham Act. Um, and you know the fact that there is reference to the primary significance test in the Lanham Act, doesn't that mean that um, Goodyear is maybe no longer good law, which was the respondent's argument. What do you, what do you, so the question is really, what's the relevance of the Lanham Act, if, if any, do you think? Isn't it worse than that? Didn't he make the point that the Lanham Act is pre-internet? That was a Lido, I thought. Because that, that was worrying as well. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so, you know, I, I think there's this problem with the court wanting to be able to say, just read the statute, it's right there. And they really want to do that, and it's really not. Uh, so we, even if you say, okay, primary significance is the test, primary significance of what, how do you figure it out, right? That is precisely the question here, especially if it, it, in the Goodyear, like Goodyear actually is a test for figuring out the primary significance of a claimed mark. It may not be one you like, but it is indeed a test. Uh, and so, uh, especially when a statute exists with a common law background, um, the court's approach is not gonna be great. And as somebody else said about Romag um, recently, I thought was, this was a great insight, which is uh, in a common law system, you will always be able to find one case on the other side. And to say that therefore the common law rule was unclear is probably a mistake. That uh, it's just like in a common law system, there are a whole bunch of decisions, right? And you know, uh, yeah, random chance is going to get a couple wrong ones. Um, but because the court does not have a great sense of how to integrate a common law background into a statutory scheme, um, it it is looking for simple solutions uh, that may not exist. One of the interesting things to me on that point is when I wrote that article I mentioned five years ago, I thought then 
that the statute, I, I think I misread the statute, frankly. If you were looking for a really clear statute to give you a really clear rule that says you don't protect generic marks, the Lanham Act is currently drafted actually doesn't do that for you. That's right. It was surprising to me mm -hmm. when I looked back at it because I think I just had in my head and I hadn't spent a lot of time parsing that. And mm -hmm. I think that is one of the things the court's struggling with. I, can, I think Rebecca's exactly right. What do we do with the common law? Uh, I, I do think it signals, and there were several justices, I think, signaling this, that there is some skepticism that primary significance won't be enough, given that we see it referenced in the statute, and given that we don't see some sort of clear statement that says, if determined by an examiner or a judge that a mark is generic, it can't acquire protection, because we don't have that statement in the statute. Yeah, I, I think um, there... Maybe it was maybe it was uh, Chief Justice Roberts. I think somebody got cut off, and it, and I thought maybe they were going to suggest, or it seemed like it was heading in the direction of suggesting that perhaps primary significance is a test which works for some questions of uh, whether a mark is generic. Those marks which started out as uh, strong, fanciful, arbitrary, whatever, um, maybe not the best test for those marks which are an appropriation of a, a, a very descriptive term for the genus of the goods. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's right. And what something that stood out to me um, about the discussion of that statutory provision, especially given this this approach Rebecca mentioned of, of you know really wanting to just say, okay, here's what does the statute say? They were really most of the time just excising an entire phrase from the statute where it says the primary significance of the registered mark to the relevant public rather than purchaser motivation shall be the test. So that's, I mean, that's a really interesting feature of it to me because, and it, it goes to the point that I think the, the PTO attorney, um, or Erica Ross is making, um, you know, saying that this was a repudiation of a specific Ninth Circuit opinion, um, where, you know, which of those is more, it, it depends on kind of which of, of those pieces of the provision you take as more important and how you interpret it, you know, is, is the more important part, is it, is it saying primary significance, like is the test, or is this more about saying purchaser motivation is not the test? Like what is the more, um, uh, you know, salient part of that? What was the more salient part of that for Congress? Um, if, and, you know, maybe they're equal, but, but point being, I think it, it gives it a very different context when you see it being put in opposition to this other test and purchaser motivation is not at all the test that the PTO is advocating for. Um, so it, it's not like it is contrary to the plain meaning necessarily when, when you read this in context. So uh, we are really out of time. I, um, I don't know, Russell, if you can hear me and if you would launch the second poll, that would be great. Um, so I'm gonna ask the audience um, to make a prediction and we usually ask um, the panelists whether they'd like to make a prediction. And, I, and again, I'd like to ask you maybe um, to make a more specific prediction, not just who will win, but what do you think the outcome will be? What do you think the Supreme Court is going to say about how we determine when marks are generic? I think it's tough, but I think it is five or maybe six votes to affirm. Roberts, Thomas, Kagan, Gorsuch, maybe Kavanaugh and Alito. Um, and I think they're going to argue some combination of primary significance test works well enough or the other tools, Gorsuch's other tools move works well enough. Uh, and for whatever reasons you might imagine, Thomas and Kavanaugh and Alito quite excited to say in a concurrence, if not in the majority, that Goodyear is no longer good law. Um, and I think you'll see a dissent by Breyer and a dissent by, um, on competition grounds and a dissent by Justice Ginsburg that is basically uh, the old um, uh, blinded veterans case. Unfair competition would do the work here. 
and I don't know, I don't have a strong sense for where Justice Sotomayor falls. That's my guess. Very specific guess, Jake. I think I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll be a pessimist and say I'm not entirely sure, but my, my pessimist gut reaction is that uh, it will end up going for booking.com and that I will end up being frustrated by the opinion saying it's okay because likelihood of confusion test and thin protection and fair use will get it done. Um, not so much for the people who can't afford to litigate to that point. Okay, Marty or Rebecca? I don't like to make predictions, but um, I'm leaning in the direction the other panelists already are. All right, a, a, a marginal win. Marty? Good years out. Good years out. I think there's going to be, I think that, I think Rebecca has doomed their survey. <laughs> I, you know, they could wind up going off on a, on a rationale that wasn't highlighted today, hopefully the 800 cases. Um, I don't know. It's too close to call. I think they might. I think Goodyear is out, let's put it that way. I think that they may find a way of describing primary significance. Too close to call. Yeah, all right. Well, that's fun because we had a couple of trademark cases that were not too close to call. Um, so this is, this is new and exciting. And as you can see, the audience are kind of right with you, even though the audience thought um, that the mark was generic um, they are not so um, confident that the government will win. It's a, a slim, uh, it, a, a slim um, favoring for booking.com winning. Um, so I wish we could talk more, but I'm sure you all have uh, things to do. And we, we promised only an hour and we're already over, so we shouldn't take up more time. Um, but it was just so great to hear from you today, the day of, when we all want to know what to make of this. Um, and I really appreciate all the time that you've put into the case, both in your briefs and um, preparing for this and, and uh, giving us your insights now. So thank you so much. Um, I, am, I have to go to dinner now. It's DC dinner time. And I have ordered some takeout of some dead crabs from the crab house, which I will eat. And for dessert, I've got some cheesecake that has been made in a factory uh, coming. So something I have to look forward to. So, no waffles? <laughs> no, because it's not breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to wake up those waffles in their house. Um, so thank you guys so much. Audience, thank you so much um, for tuning in. Thank for you. Asking questions and staying with us. And uh, come back and see us uh, at the next case, which I think should probably be um, Oracle v. Google, which will be really interesting, and we'll have a great discussion about that. Thank you, and take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.